Welcome to another Museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, President and Chief Instigator at POW, Paul Orselli Workshop here on Long Island. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Kathy Kraft. How are you, Kathy? I'm doing great. It's fun to talk with you. Oh, thank you. Always nice to speak with you. And I just wanted to let people know that uh, you do not have a a clever Zoom background of a warehouse. You are actually in the Science Center warehouse, uh, which is very appropriate for our conversation. But before we launch into our conversation, maybe you could just give uh, people a little sense of your background. And I always, I always say, Absolutely. how how is it that you ended up here right now? <laughs> So actually right in this very building in 1991, I volunteered to build just one exhibit. Um, we were very much a volunteer built community. So going back a little further, I grew up in California, went to college in Minnesota where I majored in physics and I came to Cornell as a grad student in 1976. So you can do the math. Um, as a grad student, did, uh, did you know finished my PhD in experimental low temperature physics and a postdoc and then stayed home with my kids when they were young by choice. I have three wonderful grown up adult daughters. And so we were members of the local science center. So this is sort of the convergence of the path. And our science center was founded by two women who were doing activities out of a janitor's closet in a school in downtown Ithaca. And they got, you know, so they, they posted something in the paper about anybody interested in more science in the community and 50 people turned up for that meeting. I was not at that point involved. And so we were doing the temporary storefront thing. And then eventually we did a community build. We took an old wastewater pumping station. Mind you, this is Ithaca, New York. So we are. 200 miles west of New York City. We are not, even though people think we're upstate means Westchester, we are in the middle of kind of nowhere, but we have Cornell University, Ithaca College and other many assets, lakes and things. Um, so we got started doing the temporary storefront thing and then we did community build to build a 6,000 square foot facility with an outdoor science park. And that's where I came and I volunteered to build just one exhibit in 1991. And well, so, and the rest, as they say, is history. Absolutely. You're still, you're, you're still at it. Well, I am that's still at it. And I've been an official employee for 25 years, but we are very much volunteer built and still rely on volunteers a lot. Um, we used to have volunteer exhibit build. And now we have, you know, builds and things. And now we have um, much more talented staff. We as an organization have evolved, of course. But so we have evolved. I've evolved. So, you know, I wouldn't have said you know, 30 years ago that I thought I would be doing this and I'm really grateful. It's neat to combine the science and the problem solving and the things I love and do something that really matters, which I think science education really matters, so. Well, if you're, yeah. if, if you're a doctorate in physics, I, I should hope so, so. Yes, but I just think as a community and a nation and an international organization. So we have gone from the little storefront to you're having a now about 25,000 square foot facility plus the warehouse. And most of what I do as part of the exhibits crew is take care of our traveling exhibitions. So we, have ah. about we travel all over the US and Canada, um, half of which we've developed and half of which other people have come to us and said, would you manage the tour for us? So and that's, so that's actually a, a good segue into our conversation and your yeah. location is very apt. Do you see all the shelves and I'm sure spare parts and things Whoa. behind you? Lots That's, of we we want to talk. We want to talk a little nuts and bolts today, uh, you know, really about um, not only how we can build better exhibits and create conceptually better exhibits to make uh, better experiences for our end users and our visitors. But also, I'm sure you have some tips in those intervening 30 years when you mistakenly thought you were only going to be building one exhibit as a volunteer and then adios, I'm busy with my daughters. Um, you know, things that you think uh, anybody who might be, you know, there are the trajectory that you mentioned for the Science Center is, is a common trajectory for many museums. They start out as very much uh, people around a, a kitchen table or community members. We want to have a resource, a museum in our community, and uh, they might start building things with local resources and volunteers. So um, maybe uh, a way to 
to throw a, a softball your way is, you know, if you had to pick out a couple things, like if there, there's somebody watching this video and saying, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working on a shoestring. What, what are some of the things that you think are important uh, when you are building or developing exhibits to, to make the best possible exhibits with the resources you have available? Well, no matter what, safety comes to mind. And I think that's where we met. I think we met at an Aztec session that I organized in about 2005 um, on, you know, sort of safety and thinking about how do you make, I mean, just plain old safe. You're not going to stay open if you have things that are really dangerous. And we have an 8,000 square foot outdoor science park with, you know, a big overhead lever and suspension bridge. So we take safety pretty seriously. So I just want to throw out there as you get started to think in mind that there are some resources. There's nothing explicit for museums. There are design guidelines, universal design guidelines, Smithsonian, ADA regulations and things that are helpful. You know, how tall, how tall should something be so that somebody with a wheelchair or, you know, there's that kind of stuff. Whoop, whoop, I'm on standing on a rolling, with a rolling cart here. Um, but there's- Be also, safe, be safe. It's, just, it's, just a roll, it's a donated luggage cart that I propped my laptop on so that I could be pointing in the right direction. Um, but coming back to safety, so there's, you know, thinking about that, there are some guidelines and there's also playground safety standards. So you can go to the US, oh, I forget who it is now. And you can look up playground safety guidelines, which we use inside for things like coat hooks. They're protrusion hazards because playgrounds end up with kids ending up in emergency rooms. They had tracked that data to figure out what was causing injury. So there are protrusion hazard gauges, you know, and you can build them yourself. There are head entrapment standards. If you've got railings with posts, they should be, you know, no, not between three and a half and nine inches because a kid could get their head in there and then get stuck you know, no long rope. So there's some very simple sort of safety stuff that has to be forefront. Well, um, and uh, since this will ultimately appear on YouTube, I will, I will say we will include links to references below. And I think what you just mentioned, Kathy, is really important because I think a lot of times when people are starting out building exhibits or they're learning to build exhibits or they have volunteer or local craftspeople or artists help right. them, you know, sometimes there's a, there's a guesswork, which is <laughs> like, which is fine if you're guessing about the color of something, right. let's say, but if you're guessing about uh, whether something is an electrical shock hazard yeah. or somebody's going to poke their eye out, um, it really behooves people to take advantage of resources like the ones you mentioned to uh, ensure that we create uh, a safe and secure environment for people. Yeah. Underwriters, which, doesn't mean, under which doesn't mean it can't be fun, yeah. but it should be safe and fun. So. Underwriters, laboratories, you know, guideline, but I think that you have to buy books from them maybe. I'm not quite sure, but you can look online and find some resources. Um, for this, that, or the other. We certainly learned a lot 20 years ago when we had an exhibition going to Epcot Center, which was a big deal. And a UL guy came and worked with us through the exhibition and said, you know, you, this should be in a box and this should have a fuse and no, you can't use power strips. And so we, we really upped our game, but that was just a very fluky gift that we had to share science with a million people in six months. I mean, it all worked oh, out. Wow. It was, it, it was pretty crazy. Long story. So obviously safety is one of the safety facets of the that, uh, that people should think about and, and there are resources, like I said. With, and with, then with probably Alex next on my mind it, and rounding corners and sort of pinch points and pretty obvious stuff. The next thing that comes to my mind is prototyping. Yeah, I think we've, we've done joy of prototyping things before yes. too. You, 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 we... you, you always get a positive response from me exactly. when you talk about prototype. So actually, you know, though prototyping is one of those words like interactive or yeah. immersive or edutainment, it, you know, it, it sort of means everything yes. and, and nothing. So maybe in your own words, when you think about prototyping, what does it mean? Like, or when you are doing exhibits or you're thinking about improving, because I, I think prototyping is also a way oh, to, absolutely. Uh, it's very a, an iterative process. So you're continually thinking about improving. So uh, what does prototyping really mean to you 
and what sorts of resources or things uh, do you think are important for people to think about in that regard? Absolutely. And it, one thing it means to me immediately is the visitor is always right. And we can't get it right. I mean, in everything we've done, we've always tweaked things. I mean, it, you just, you think you got it all figured out and then they do or they don't engage or they don't get it. I mean, this we, never, hard, we never thought they would do this with well, that exhibit they, and they, then... They, or that they would really like it or that they wouldn't like it. I mean, you know, I mean, it's always cheating to have water exhibits. They're more maintenance, but kids love water. So that's that's cheating, but that's okay too. Um, but, you know, but really I've done things as simple as laying out cardboard things. I want some bins with some blocks and mocking up cardboard and seeing if people can reach and just the physical nature of, can I see it? Can I see the sign? Do I figure out what to do? I will sit and watch. If this were a PowerPoint, I would have examples with, with a stream of pictures of this is the different things we went along the way to getting an exhibit that actually worked. Well, we can, if, if you like, we could include some references or PowerPoints. We'll, we'll, we'll save that. We'll but, say, we'll put that on the but I like, I like, you know, the, I think it's important. The first thing you mentioned was cardboard and just Absolutely. laying, like just getting on with it and using the materials you have to try things out. Yeah, so we've done a lot of prototyping. And that was one of the gifts of getting a couple of grants to build traveling exhibitions early on in our history, 20 years ago, and having the opportunity to put them out and try them out and bring in outside evaluators. Um, and they loved coming and working with us because we would, I would stay right there on the floor with them. And if they had a suggestion or they wanted to try a new label or something, I was down in the shop and we were back and we, you know, in a half an hour, we had done something different. And so we didn't just send them out there with a the clipboard and say, give us a report. We worked with them to make our exhibits better. And it makes a big difference. Signage, what the words say, even putting all your signage up, just print it out on a bulletin board for staff to look at, to get it as simple as possible. And there's graphic design, and that's not my expertise, but but just the nuts and bolts of what to do, where to well, put it. Sometimes, sometimes when I'm working with graduate design students, I will say that sometimes the easiest way to fix an exhibit is to change the label, because oftentimes there's a there's an instruction, you know, to start the experience, and it confuses people. And it's not that the experience isn't a good one or the exhibit component isn't interesting, but you know, if if right away there's a problem with people starting, they might, you know, they walk away from it. And sometimes as simple as just changing the wording or the graphics on well, a label can make a big difference. I don't count on people reading labels either. I mean, we call it, you know, context of navigation. I want you to be able to walk up and get engaged and then you start getting more engaged and then you start, you know, you've got somebody with you and you start asking each other questions and then you have this whole conversation, this process of science that we talk about a lot. So that's one of the things we try and foster. Well, that's, that's, uh, so the tips are coming fast and furious here. I think what you just <laughs> said is worth yeah. pausing on for a moment, you know, the, the idea that and it's how intuitive an experience can be, how uh, an experience can bring people, even strangers together to cooperate and work Absolutely. together. I mean, looking for those opportunities. And again, you mentioned evaluation and you mentioned prototyping. Yeah. Um, these things can be very formalized, but also they can be literally as informal as just taking some time to watch what's going on in your museum and with some new exhibits like, wow, you know, 10 people in a row did this thing. Right, exactly. And it's clear that something's not right. So what can we change to change that situation? And it know? really only takes a half dozen people to sort of figure that out. And I've built like cabinets in different shapes to see what works for people when it's like a competitive, how close can you get in timing something? And, you know, are they near each other or can you not see, you know, there, there's there's a lot of that kind of simple stuff, layout, layout kind of stuff too. Yeah, I think- you know before that, I'm also thinking, I mean, if I want it to be effective, I am thinking about things like logistics of, can I gather around? Can I see what the other person's doing? Can I bring people over? Because there's a lot of research on family learning. There's also a lot of research on gender issues. There's now the whole EDGE program, which I think was led by the Exploratory, maybe? Exhibit design. And, you know, there's, so there's a lot of studies now on gender issues. You know, sure. I remember hearing that Aztec presentation years ago where they were watching how the parents were engaged with the girls and the boys and it was different. 
And, you know, they did some different things with the exhibits and found out how to make it so that they worked better for everybody. So there's, you know, there's research out there in the field. Oh, yeah. Well, and like we said, you know, the, the thing is, um, it's important to bridge your own intuitive experience and expertise, but there, you know, it's also valuable. You Why know, don't the, you the, get that? Well, the, the thing is, um, one of the, I'm sure you and I both agree that one of the nicest things about the museum profession is its tendency to uh, be a sharing profession. Absolutely. That's and on my so, list. So, you know, um, take advantage of the information that people share and that, and I just wanted, I just, uh, it, it just, we're, go, we're going fast and furious, but I just wanted to mention <laughs> another resource since you mentioned the EDGE project um, and you were talking about like different size and different dimensions and shape cabinetry. Um, I, I was an advisor for uh, Project APE, Active yes. Prolonged Engagement um, at the Exploratorium. And there is a book actually related to that project, yes. that Project APE, Active Prolonged Engagement. And I think um, that is another excellent resource for people who are interested in developing um, mm -hmm. exhibitions and really thinking about the iterative process because that particular project took existing exhibits and really took another look at them and said, oh, wh what are the sort of rough edges or what, what are the things that we can really shift or change and be careful observers of so that these experiences can be even more satisfying and provide active prolonged engagement as the title implies. So yep. um, that's not a resource we'll call out for all yep. of you. Absolutely, yep. So we, there's we've also hit, we've hit. generations, there's you know, getting people to engage, there's being tactile, there's different senses, there's a lot of things that you try and factor in when you're building an exhibit or an exhibition. Well, so that's, um, so we, we touched on safety first right. and we touched on prototyping, we touched on sharing and resources, but you kind of mentioned something oh, here. Resources. When you, ah, yeah, resources. okay. Yeah. That's why I like visual aids. Uh, uh, <laughs> Paul and I have been doing this for a long time and we'll, first of all, I will plug their website, McMaster Carr. This is the Bible. He called it the same thing I did. It was pretty funny. Um, it's hard to get a hold of a paper catalog. In fact, I don't yeah, know. But it's, on, it's online. So. It's online. And they have one of the top rated websites in the world for the ease of you using. Can, that is a website. If you are a person who wants to make things, anything really, not just exhibits. Right. Like literally, if you wanted to buy one specialty screw or you wanted to buy like a railroad wheel or some yep. crazy thing, you're like, okay, I can get it from McMaster Car. Yeah. And plumbing, and so for somebody who's in the traveling exhibits world, it's great because you know they're pretty standardized. They sell things from little hydraulic jacks to clear tubing for balls, runs for, you know, things. And they, and they may not be they, the cheapest place to buy something, but well, the and they ship, people. and they usually uh, around usually, the country uh, here in yeah. North America, in the United States, they sh they ship quickly too, which is also an important consideration if you're trying to repair something if you don't. If you don't have spare parts, I'll just I'll just highlight again. Kathy's sitting in front of a whole bunch of shelves where I'm sure those are bunches of spare parts. You know. Oh, you've got <laughs> it. I've got everything here. No, that's great. So I have hokey pokey Elmos. I've got. Oh, I've got I've got everything. I mean, and again, with a traveling exhibition, I keep a fair amount of like parts that I think you'll need sure. with the exhibition. But it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of backup. You know, back well, apart. so um, since we're on resources, so you mentioned McMaster Carr, and they have uh, we call it the Yellow Bible, but they have their online thing. Um, are there any other uh, well, resources I, that came top of mind? Well, there's Granger is another big catalog, MSC, and I forget what it stands for, but they've got a lot of hardware. Yeah. I, when I started in this business, there was no real internet presence for all this, so you can find a lot of this by going to Amazon or whatever. But years ago, Paul and I put together a list for an Aztec session about resources. Which and is Paul, online. <laughs> which Paul has on his website and it's got a lot, you know, it's weird stuff. I mean, we did yeah. a little in-house exhibition on accessibility and assistive devices and fake food. And so you'll go on his website and you'll find. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a, we'll put a we'll link. Put it's there. called the, the great big exhibit resource list. And it, it has different categories like 
like Kathy said, fake food or where can I find giant sequins or, you know, all kinds of things. Um, because a lot of making exhibits and a lot of fixing exhibits and a lot of prototyping, you know, is you need to have this stuff. You, you're like, I need something that'll do something like this, but where can I get that? <laughs> you know, I need fake dirt. Uh, that was one of, that's one of my favorite listings on the great big exhibit resource list because sometimes there are historical museums or somebody's making a diorama and there are problems. Like you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna dig up some dirt and then some bugs get into your collections or that. So uh, anyway, the, we'll call out the great big I'll exhibit do, resource yeah, list exactly. and I'll, I'll give a uh, electronic tip of the hat to, to Kathy for sort of setting that into motion. Uh, low those many well, years ago as you so. can obviously tell i'm waving to the greater group out there watching later paul and i've been doing this for a while but we are in the same religion we really think it's important to share make it easier for people getting started in the business to find materials i mean there's the aztec listserv but i don't see people posting on there many what i would call nuts and bolts questions anymore there used to be kind of some hey where'd you get that emails but it's right, well, right now we know what it's all mostly about um refiguring the museums as we all open gradually and do different things, but still. Uh, but, that's a, that's a, maybe that's a, um, that's uh, that an interesting about. note to uh, sort of conclude on, you know, we, we started with safety, but we could sort of end. Uh, well, we have many safety. more things still to go about. All right, well, <laughs> you, I, don't let me slow you down. Okay, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, so we know we can talk. Um, another thing, so as we talk about design guidelines and things like that, safety inspection, stuff like that, but there's the back end of it as somebody who supports traveling exhibitions that I think is super important, which, well, there's two things. One is durability. When you get to the final exhibit, using hardware that you can replace easily, don't bury hardware with threaded inserts you can't get to when they get buggered up um, and make it so that you can take it apart and move it easily and safely. Um, I will say I've seen some pretty dangerous crates come through an exhibition that we have hosted that were just insane. We don't do that. You'll be happy to hear when we tend That's not good. to crate. And, but, but I've seen some things that were literally very dangerous. So think about your staff safety if you're moving, you know, moving things around or get dollies and, you know, whatever. We have a warehouse. We actually have a forklift and some other good things now, but we've grown over the years. Yeah, yeah, so sure. Think about that. But, but beyond making them durable so they hold up and using good finishes and good paint and whatever else, um, document. So I am a card carrying uh, member of File Folders Anonymous. Now we can move online, but I've been doing this long enough that I have file drawers, you know, sorted by exhibit, subcategories, the motor, the, the whatever. Um, where did you get it? Because you think you're going to remember what you got it from, where you got it from, how you put it together. So I have both paper files and I have, you know, to-do lists and things like that. But I also have a whole database for our traveling exhibitions. It's simple. It's just, you know, exhibition, exhibit, part what it is, where did I get it from? How many of them are in there? How many spares? What shelf are they on? How many are with the exhibition? But keeping track of that stuff early on will save you a lot of grief. You know, there used to be some complaints about my file drawers and the people come and say, do you have the information for, and you know, so it's- Well, it's I, think, I think though, especially in light of uh, the way we started this conversation, if you are working with volunteers or yeah. you're working with local resources or you're working with, in the case of a college town students, and you know, the people who actually had their hands on developing the exhibit go away, you know, and the, the information goes away with them also if you don't document it. So, you know, well, where do we get that specialty pump for this exhibit or whoa, oh yeah, those, we, we got those super hinges, but right. yeah, where did they come from come again? From. You know, so I think that what, um, that might be one of the most uh, underappreciated <laughs> things is Mine documentation. Mine appreciated, but yes, but I No, you know. no, I mean, or, or overlooked, you know, people, people are ex excited and people are busy and they move on to the next thing before they even completely finish and document the previous Our thing. business manager will test that I'm the only person who every, every so often would visit his office and just go through the receipts that everybody turned in in the exhibits team to capture information that 
wasn't being well that's that's a good tip i mean now, that's the way to do now, it now we're doing more i mean as a staff we're more organized and there's a lot of things being scanned and put up on google drive and whatever so that will make going forward will be easier but, all right kathy well i i know you have a lot of things but i'm gonna i'm still gonna I, I I, i'm still gonna i'm still gonna hit hit you with hit me with one last one one last one if I were going to change the topic completely, just a little bit. Just like, <laughs> that's your prerogative. You're that's well, no, just before before we go, I do want to say that we're a small museum, even though we have a big presence and we're part of a bunch of big grants. I just think as, an, as, as we evolve, it's, I don't know what it's like to work at a big museum. We don't have a big structure. We, you know, we work together, the exhibits team, we all work together. And so it makes it a lot easier to be fleet of foot, to be small, to change things because we don't have, so for better or worse, we don't have a group of people designing and we don't have, we work with an outside graphics person who's wonderful when we, you know, when it, for like national grants, big traveling exhibitions, but, but we can be fleet of foot and we can say, this isn't going to work or let's all get together and figure out how to make this better without offending anybody either. So I'm just going to throw out there that I think no, it's- No, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say, I'll just say to, to wrap that up, uh, with two points about small museums, uh, specifically about Science Center in, in Ithaca, but in general, uh, small museums yeah, hold a place are, in my yeah. heart. So I say small but mighty. And the other thing I'll just say from a practical matter, even though uh, the big museums get the attention, uh, naturally, just from sheer numbers, the vast majority of museums around the world actually are small museums, you know. So, and we work with most of them. I mean, of the 150, 160 museums we've rented, we have rented to some big places. And we have rented to a lot of tiny children's museums where two retired grandfathers unload the truck and set the exhibition up. And we get to share great science with a lot of different people that way. So yes, there are a lot of them, a lot of small museums out there. And there's some neat stuff happening at big museums. They can be oh, yeah. oh, cutting yeah. edge on occasion and do, you know, explore like, like, Minnesota. Like, like Will I mean, Rogers, like Will Rogers a aphorism. Uh, you know, it, it's it's hard for me to think of a museum that I can't like, you know. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always something to find at a museum. Well, well, I have favorites and less favorites. I mean, you know, where can I do? You can gauge it by how many pictures I take. Just like I take tens of thousands <laughs> of pictures. That's my thermometer. Well, hopefully, hopefully that doesn't apply to your three children or my four children. No. How many pictures we take of them? No, and I have grandchildren, so <laughs> oh, well. imagine I, I win the prize. But I mean, even for each one of these travelers, I probably have 10,000 pictures. How the hardware goes together, where the wires chase, you know, an assembly taken apart so you can see how it goes together, things like that. But, but even for these back to the, you know, your in-house exhibits, having a few pictures doesn't hurt. Well, um, I, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to say this is uh, definitely one of the times that I'm glad this is a recorded interview and not a live interview. And the, the reason I say that is you are such a fireball, Kathy Kraft, and we have dispensed so much information and I'm sure there will be so many resources below that people might need to take this in small doses. <laughs> so, but, but I really, Kathy, it's always a pleasure to of see course. you and speak Absolutely. with you. And uh, I really appreciate you and taking the time. And I appreciate time. all you do for bringing the field together. So keeping us going. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I'll That's, see you here at Aztec in person. Hey, uh, I, you know, uh, that can't happen soon enough that we will all feel happy and safe to to be able to visit museums and visit with each other. So I, I, the sooner, the better, I'm sure. You can visit us on your way to Pittsburgh. Hey, that'll be awesome. All yeah. right, thanks thanks again, yeah, Kathy. Thank I you really everybody. appreciate yeah, we've it. got questions. My email address is on our Science Center website. You have to spell Science oh, we'll, Center right. We we'll, spell it we'll, funny. We'll include, we'll include we'll uh, your contact info also uh, on the in the information so that I, I you might be opening up the floodgates, but you. No, you. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> That's good. Well, thanks again, Kathy. Yes, well, thanks thank very you, much. Paul. Take yeah. care. Stay safe. Stay well. You too.